All right, so this is the third part of chapter 10, which is gonna be an angular momentum. So in this chapter, in this part, we will learning about angular momentum, which is kind of similar to the linear momentum that was used to describe things like collisions. Um, so whenever we're talking about linear momentum, remember it was the, the product of object mass and uh, velocity. So um, this was, P for the momentum, so mass times velocity. Momentum was a vector because the velocity was a vector. So think of it like this. Now, if you have a particle that is either just moving on its own or maybe like, let's say, part of a disk or something like that. And when it's moving, so let's say, imagine that this disk is basically rotating. So then this particle, in a way, tracing this, you know, uh, circle as well. So that instant it has like, let's say this particular velocity, right? Maybe like, let's say I can try to do a little better. So maybe something like this, right? Like that. So this instant it has a velocity which is tangent to the path. And it's since it has a mass, that means it also has a momentum, which is P times, you know, P equals M times V. That means since it's moving, it has a mass, that particle, right? It has a momentum, linear momentum. And now what we can do here is we can see that in a way with respect to the axis of rotation, this particle is, has distance R from the axis of rotation. So we can then calculate this quantity that we call angular momentum. In a way, very similar to everything we've been doing before, right? So there's velocity, then there's angular velocity. There's you know, acceleration, then there's you know, angular acceleration. So now this is linear momentum, then there's angular momentum. And if you remember, right, all of those equations are kind of, you know, you know, delta S equals R times delta theta, you know, uh, V is equals to R times omega, uh, A is equals to R times alpha. So it's not surprised that, you know, the quantity that we call angular momentum is R times P, which is the linear momentum. The only thing here is, you know, in this particular context, because the, you know, both of those quantities are, uh, let's say um, vectors. So when you're doing the product, you are looking at pretty much a cross product. So when you're doing R times P, so this is technically R cross P because angular momentum is a vector that is perpendicular to the plane of the particle motion. Let's say wherever the particle is moving the plane, the angular momentum will always perpendicular to that plane. So it's a cross product. That means I can look at this in terms of, you know, L equals, you know, R cross P, which is then equals R times P times then sine of theta, right? Theta being the angle between them. In this case, let's say if I'm looking at this, or, you know, you can call this phi if you want, right? So I'll do phi because so like that. So this will be the angular momentum of a, you know, a particle moving around uh, in a, let's say, circular path. So I can also replace this with R times P is then M times V and then sine of phi. So then you can say that this is the equation of the angular momentum if you're dealing with the with the particle. So you can use this equation for the particle. All right. So the units for the angular momentum are kilograms times meter per second, uh, me, kilograms times meter square per second, because again, if the angular momentum is uh, R times M times V times sine of phi. So R is meters, M here is kilograms, velocity is meters per second. So you can write it kilograms times meter square per second because sine of phi is unitless. All right. So. And one of the things we have here, you can see right, the, uh, both the magnitude and the direction of L depend on the choice of origin. Because if, let's say, if you have a particle moving like this, if you have a particle moving like that, then uh, one of the things I can do here is, so let's say if this is, you know, my coordinate system, if this is my origin, then this is R. So then this is P, right? Uh, and then, you know, let's say this is phi. So then I can calculate that. But what if, let's say, my you know, my origin changes to somewhere over here? Then let's say then this is R, right? You can see, right? So and then this is phi, and so it can in a way change depending on what we use as a as a you know 
axis of rotation or, or choice of origin, right? So it kind of depends on that. So the direction of L is perpendicular to the plane formed by R and P, as I already mentioned. So let's say if, if this is your plane, which is uh, let's say plane of the page, and let's say here's your coordinate system, and let's say here's a particle moving with this velocity, and this is your origin. So this will be then R, right? So as a vector, this is then V, that means I can, if it has a mass, I can think of that as a, you know, uh, in terms of like momentum. So then in which direction, let's say is an angular momentum? Well, again, we use the right-hand rule. So you have your fingers in the direction of the R, which is the first vector. And then that means your, your fingers should be more or less in the direction of, you know, the, the vector R like that but such that your palm has to face the direction of the velocity because then you can curl your fingers in that direction because then if you're able to curl your fingers in that direction, right? So then your thumb will be pointing basically out of the page if you try to do that. I know it's difficult to draw that, you know, kind of like a right hand. So, but in a case, so if, if you do that, right? Your fingers in the direction of the R, your palm then facing the direction of the velocity. And if you curl your fingers in the direction of the velocity, your thumb should be pointing out of the page. That means more or less in the Z direction. So that will be out of the page for the angular momentum as a vector. So this equation gives the magnitude of that particle, angular momentum, and then direction given with the right-hand rule. All right, so, all right, so here what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to remember that, for example, here for the linear, angular moment, a uh, linear momentum. Remember, what was the, uh, let's say, what what changes linear momentum? So we talked about, okay, so if you wanna change the linear momentum, what was responsible for changing linear momentum? Remember that equation was, we calculated in terms of some external force, if acting in a system or on a particle, then it can change the linear momentum of the particle. That force equals dp dt. So similar thing we wanna do in terms of angular momentum. So let's say what is responsible for changing angular momentum. And remember, so we have for the angular variable that is kind of analogous to the force in a linear system is torque, right? That means we can look at, okay, so let's say if we have a torque, here's the torque and the equation for the torque is R cross, R cross F. And then F is let's say, let's assume it's an external you know, force. That means you know, it can be replaced with dp dt. That means now I have r cross dp dt. All right, so then what I have here is this. So we have r cross dp dt, okay? So, and if we take the derivative of, of this uh, with respect to time, right? So let's say the, the right side of the equation, if I take this and you know, take the derivative of that. So I can say then uh, derivative of, you know, the L dt, which is remember the previous equation is R cross P, right? So becomes uh, D dt of R cross P. So if I take that equation for the angular momentum and take the derivative of that. So L is equals to R cross P. So if I do DL dt, D R cross uh, P as a vector. So one of those equations that we learned, right? So let, let's say distribution, right? So this becomes D R DT cross P plus R cross DP DT. Okay, so we end up with this. Now, one of the things we have here is this first term is equals to zero. The first term is equals to zero because the reason why we have that is what is the RDT? The RDT is velocity. So if I'm doing velocity cross momentum and what is momentum? Is mass times velocity. So if I'm doing velocity cross velocity, well, obviously we learn, right? Yeah, I will get zero because I'm doing the cross part of the same, you know, same vector. So we will get zero for that. So, but the second, you know, quantity doesn't go to zero. That means I can say that change in angular momentum as a function of time, the LDT, right? Basically, I wanna know what would change the angular momentum as a function of time. So if I do this, the LDT, 
what I basically get here is R cross dBt dP dt. Now, what is R cross dBt dt? Well, we just learned that that nothing but the torque, right? Torque itself, because it's R cross F, and F is dP dt, so it's R cross dP dt, which is then equals also to the change in angular momentum. So we can assume that this is basically change in angular momentum, R cross dP, you know, dP dt, and torque is equals to R cross dP dt. That means those two quantities then also equal to one another. And that's what we have. So that the total angular momentum can vary with time only if there is a net external torque on the system, okay? Which in a way you can think of it like this. So let's look at the, uh, some kind of, you know, an object like a, let's say a disc, right? So if, even if it's a you know, rigid object, you can think of like, let's say, if you choose some kind of particle on that disc, right? So some kind of particle, um, then if this disc is at rest, then this particle at rest, right? Then this particle at rest. That means angular momentum initial is equals to zero because this particle is part of the disc and disc is not moving. So particle is not moving, angular momentum is zero. Now, what do I do to make the particle, you know, change its angular momentum, which is in a way means it's, you know, it's moving. Well, exert some kind of force. Imagine, let's say if, if there's, if it's wrapped around by, you know, by a rope like this, I can just pull on the rope, which means I exert torque. If I exert torque, then this guy will start moving with some velocity. That means now it has a angular momentum, right? Because it's M times R times V sine of V. That means now it has a V, it has an angular momentum. So that's kind of what we can do. That means, you know, to change the angular momentum of a particle or even of a system, right? I need to, uh, you know, exert uh, a torque. Exert torque, and then I can have the particle basically changing its angular momentum, which is exactly similar to the linear momentum, right? If you have a particle just sitting there with no linear momentum, what do we do to change its momentum? We apply force, external force, and it starts moving, so its linear momentum is changed. So kind of like analogous to that. All right, so you can say then net external torque is what responsible for the changing the total linear momentum of either particle or maybe system of particles. So this is the primary equation in the angular momentum version of the non-isolated system model. Why is it non-isolated? Because we assume that your system is open to um, having external torque acting on it. So that's kind of like the difference, you know. Um, now, let's say then, if you're talking about an entire object rather than the particle P, right, as this point. So let's say, what if I'm talking about the entire object, entire disk? Well, that means, you know, I need to do then the total linear momentum, which is linear momentum of up particle one, two, three, four, five, and all the, you know, I number of particles and just basically adding them together, all of those particles, adding them together. Well, here's what I have. So let's take velocity. And remember that equation that we can always use to express velocity, R times omega. Linear velocity, tangential velocity is R times omega. I can always replace that. And if I do that, now I have two terms with R and I can, you know, basically combine them together and then one time with omega. Now, why do I want to do this? Because remember, even if I have a system, right? So let's say, here's my disk. See, if I'm talking about different particles, depending on how far away they are from the axis of rotation, they have different linear speed. But all of them have the same angular speed as we learned in part one. That means I can just, if I'm using omega, I can say that this is the same omega for all of them. And I can kind of, you know, separate them, right? Factor it out. And then in the quantity, then I have this, sum of m sub i times r sub i square. And hopefully you remember what this quantity is. That quantity is the moment of inertia, right? So that expression in parentheses is the moment of inertia. So if I'm talking about not particle, but the entire, let's say rigid object, then angular momentum is given as I times omega. So things like this. So this is, you know, uh, object in a way, like let's say a rigid object. And the angular momentum is R times M times V times sine of phi. This is then again for the particle. So depending on what are you, uh, what type of problem you have. Is it you have a particle or do you have a, you know, maybe a particle and, you know, object together and things like that. So you you, you will see that in, in, in some examples and also in some of the homework problems and things like that. 
So kind of, you know, combining everything that we learned so far together, okay? So we have then this entire, uh, let's say, equation that we learned about rotational kinematics and dynamics and energy and so on and so forth. So let's look at kinetic energy. So there are now two types of kinetic energies, right? So there is a rotational kinetic energy and there is a translational, by the way, translational is the same as linear right? Translational kinetic energy, one half I omega square for translational one half mv square. What do we need for equilibrium? Well, for the translational motion, we need net external force to be zero. What do we need for the rotational motion, right? Say rotational, you know, systems, we need net torque equals zero. What do we need for the complete static equilibrium? Well, we need both of those you know, combined, right? In order for the system to be completely at rest. Newton's second law, well, translational F equals MA, rotational torque equals I times alpha or net torque equals I times alpha. Then we have, uh, you can think of like, let's say this net external torque can go into changing the angular momentum of your system of your or, or of your particle. Similar way as the net external force can go and change the linear momentum of your particle, all right? So momentum. So the, for the momentum, then what we have here is angular momentum, I times omega. This is for the rigid object, remember? And linear momentum, M times V, okay? So there's a second equation, right? For the linear angular momentum, which is RM, you know, basically we can say it is R, RP times sine of V, V or P is times MV. Now, we also talked about this, power equals torque times omega and power equals force times velocity. There's also the power, which is the rate at which we change energy, right? Or we use energy and things like that. So we have those two things. From here then, in terms of uh, conservation law, we talked about this, there's a, conservation of linear momentum, where during the collisions, object total momentum of the system before and after the same. And then there is a now also can be angular momentum conservation law, which means that your angular momentum of your system can also be conserved, you know, before and after, okay? So let's see then how we can apply this conservation of angular momentum, okay? So we, we know how to do the conservation of linear momentum, but we can also do conservation of angular momentum. So the principle of conservation of angular momentum is this, the total angular momentum of a system is constant in both magnitude and direction if the net external torque acting on a system is zero. That is if the system, I, system is isolated, which makes sense, right? So if my system is isolated and this net external torque which would change my, my angular momentum. If this is zero, that means dl dt equals zero. Well, if dl dt equals zero, which means what? L is constant, right? So that's kind of, you know, one thing you should remember. If net external torque equals dl dt, and if the net external torque is zero, that means the derivative of L with respect to time is zero, which means L is constant or total L is constant means angular momentum is the same before and after, let's say some kind of collision or something like that. But we don't necessarily need to have a collision for the angular momentum to be conserved. Linear momentum, more or less, you need you know, two systems, right? Colliding and then there was a, like, let's say, uh, internal forces during the collision and things like that and the you know, uh, momentum was conserved. Angular momentum actually is a little bit different. So you can have a single object that can also change its momentum before and after, because this is about rotation. So you can actually rotate just one single object rotating, and then you can change your momentum by, you know, basically doing simply, you know, a changing your moment of inertia, because it's easier to change moment of inertia because moment of inertia depends on how the mass distributed, you know, uh, and what is the axis of rotation and thing like that. So there are ways that we actually can have a single object that is rotating. And then if the single object is able to change its moment of inertia, then you know the 
we are basically looking at the conservational momentum if its system is isolated. Okay, you will see in an example of that. So anyways, the conservation of angular momentum requires that the product I and omega remains constant. That's the thing, product. That means not I remains constant or omega remains constant, but the product of the moment of inertia times angular velocity before and after is exactly equals the same. So that's why one of the things we can do here is we can actually have an object that can change the moment of inertia before and after and you know have, let's say, uh, conservation of angular momentum. So that's one of the you know important thing about this angular momentum. So this holds for rotation about act fixed axis and for rotation about an axis through the center of mass of a moving system. That means you can have a, a rigid object or you can have some kind of particle that, that both of them can be you know, uh, used for this. The net torque must be zero in any case. That means there should be no external torques. Okay, no external torques. So in a way, so at this point, we have three conservation laws that we learned. Energy, linear momentum and angular momentum. But the, the key was that if the system is isolated and the external torque is zero, then you can have conservation of energy. Energy before and after is the same and there is no transfer of energy across the system boundary. Momentum is the same if net external force on the system is zero. That means you know the, the momentum of the system before and after is the same. And in a way for the you know, linear momentum, you do, need, you do need a system of particles. So you can't really have one object uh, conserve uh, linear momentum. But for the angular momentum, if the net external torque on the system is zero and your system can be just one object or you know, multiple objects, uh, angular momentum can be conserved as long as the net external torque on the system is zero. That means you know, your system is on a, fr on, on a frictionless surface or let's say um, basically maybe in vacuum or something like that we can change the angular momentum by changing, you know, let's say the shape of the object. So that's one of the things you will see. And you will see that this basically in the next slide that I have. So for example, take an ice skater and when it's ice skater spins. Now the external torque is small, which means that because she's on the ice, right? The external torque is small. Okay, now let's see what happens. She is rotating and her shape is basically arm extended and let's say one leg extended. This is, let's say, her initial shape. And you can have then some kind of velocity with respect to the shape. So you can say, this is my initial angular momentum, which is equals to moment of inertia with respect to the, her shape, her you know, particular shape like this, right? And then whatever initial omega she has when she's rotating like this. But because she is on ice, she can change angular momentum by simply you know, let's say, no, sorry, she will, she can change the angular velocity by changing her moment of inertia. Now, how do we change the moment of inertia? Remember, she, her mass doesn't change, right? But I can change the moment of inertia by changing, uh, let's say different axis of rotation, or I can change the moment of inertia by changing the shape. And you can change your shape, right? Arm extended, arm closer to your body and things like that. Now. So let's say what I can do here is I can see, let's say what happens to, you know, let's say uh, for example, her, to, to her rotation speed, if she changes her, you know, moment of inertia, let's say shape. So let's see what happens. Now she's, she, she brings her arms and legs together and see her spin, you know, basically spin speed, right? Increased by a lot. Again, if you watch it again, you can see, right? This is the speed that she has right now. And now she changes her angle and moment of inertia and speed increased by a lot, but still the angular momentum is constant. So L final is equal to the final angular, final moment of inertia times final angular velocity. And Li is equals to Lf, moment of inertia before and after is the same. So for example, when she just started, right? Her moment of inertia was large. So let's say this is, you know, uh, for example, four times her angular velocity two, right? So let's say it's, it's equal to sort of like, let's say four times two. And when she brings her arms and legs together, her moment of inertia decreases. Why? Because most of the mass now is very close to the axis of rotation. Remember the moment of uh, the, sorry, the, the moment of inertia is equals to sum of your mass times R sub I square. 
If all the mass is very close to the axis of rotation, mo moment of inertia is small. If all the mass is far from axis of rotation, moment of inertia is large. And when she brings her arms and like close together, right? Her moment of inertia, you can see that maybe decreases, but because she's on ice, no external forces, then angular velocity, let's say increases to four. So that's why we have eight equals eight. You decrease your moment of inertia, but then you increase your angular velocity as a consequence. So that's why she's able to spin faster because of the angular momentum is conserved. Okay. So let's look at the, the you, you, you can see, right? That was an example of a single object, you know, conserving angular momentum by just changing the, the shape. So you can also have actual collision between two, you know, two objects. For example, here, a simple clutch consists of two cylindrical plates that can be pressed together to connect two sections of an axle as needed in piece of mach machinery. The two plates have mass MA equals six kilograms and MB equals nine kilograms with the right eye R naught equals 0.6 meters. Both have the same radius. They are initially separated. Plate like MA is accelerated from rest to an angular velocity omega one equals 7.2 radians per second in time uh, delta T equals two seconds. So then we're gonna calculate the angular momentum of the particle A or the, sorry, the disk A and then the torque required to have uh, accelerated MA from rest to omega one. Uh, so let's do those two parts and then we'll do the rest. All right, so let's look at uh, part A first. So for the part A, we have uh, the angular momentum of MA. So what basically calculate the angular momentum of the uh, this case. Well, what we have is this initial angular momentum, which will be I a, right? So basically this is for A times omega initial A. Uh, so basically it was zero, uh, but then the angular momentum, right? Uh, increased because there was an acceleration which increased the velocity, angular velocity to 7.2 radians per second. So let's call that final. Then we can say that final angular momentum of, of A is then a moment of inertia of A times angular velocity, final angular velocity of A. Okay, so now what is the initial angular momentum is zero because initial angular velocity was zero because it was at rest. About final angular momentum, what it's, what, well, uh, it's the moment of inertia, and because it's a disk, it's one half times mass times radius squared. That's the angular, you know, moment of inertia. Then times uh, angular velocity. Let me put it like this. So, final angular velocity of a, uh, and I can just multiply them together because I have the mass of a, I have the radius of a, and angular velocity. So I can calculate those together, right? So this will be one half times six times uh, 0.6 square, then times 7.2, let's say radians per second. All right, so I'm just skipping the units to save some room. But if I calculate this, then I can have this one as 7.8 kilograms times meters square per second. So this will be then the value for the final angular momentum. All right, so then the question for part B, right? So the question is, what is the torque required to get that? Well, the torque, external torque, right? Is equal to then dL dt, right? Or you can just delta L over delta T. You can also do that. Uh, assuming that, you know, this was basically uh, change in angular momentum before and after. So it will be then 7.8 kilograms meter square per second divided by then delta T of two seconds, which will then give us 3.9 Newtons times meters in terms of the external net torque. All right, so that was basically just the disk A starting from rest, start speeding up. Why? Because there's an external net torque, right? Acting on it. So it's increased its velocity, angular velocity from zero to 7.2 radians per second. And that's what we know, right? If there's an external torque, 
your momentum will change. Initial momentum was zero. Final momentum was 7.8 kilogram meter square. Part C is this then. Next, plate B, initially at rest, but free to rotate without friction, is placed in firm contact with freely rotating plate MA. And let's assume that MA now rotating at this angular speed of 7.2 radians per second, so it's constant rate. And then you basically pretty much drop black, you know, the, the disc B on disc A. So then, then the once you drop them, right, and the two plates both rotate, you know, at the constant angular velocity after you drop B on A. And they rotate with some angular velocity omega two, which is velocity or angular speed after, you know, you drop one over another, basically be, you know, collision, which is considerably less than omega one. And again, omega one was 7.2 radians per second. Why does this happen and what is omega two? Okay, so what happens here is this, because we are told that it can, it, it is free to rotate without friction, means that uh, once you drop them, you can assume that after that it's a conservation of angular momentum because you know there will be no external forces acting on them because that external force that increased the angular momentum of A no longer there. A is just rotating at 7.2 radians per second. And then you drop the second you know, disc on top of the first one, right? And then they basically slow down, but eventually they rotate together. So then what I can do here is I can uh, basically calculate the angular momentum of the system before and after are exactly the same. Okay, now, what is angular momentum of the system before? Well, this is angular momentum of A plus angular momentum of B before and then plus, well, this is an angular momentum of the system after because they in a way stick together, right? It's inelastic. So they stick together and I can say that LF. All right, so. Uh, then if I'm calculating this, and this is not a particle, but the you know, rigid object. So this becomes moment of inertia of A times angular velocity of A, uh, basically initially, right? Plus, then I can in a way set this to zero because uh, we know that mass B was initially at rest. So it didn't have an initial angular momentum. So plus zero, and this is equals to then final angular momentum. What is final angular momentum? Well, it's a combined mass or combined moment of inertia of both of them because they stick together, then times omega two. Then from here, we can solve for omega two, which will be moment of inertia of A times omega A divided by moment of inertia of one plus, or A, right? Plus moment of inertia of B, like that. So I plug in and calculate. All right. So uh, in a way, this, this, this quantity is basically 7.8, whatever we already calculated, right? And then divided by the sum of their mo you know, moment of inertia. And remember, so let's say here's a total moment of inertia after. This is basically one half ma r square plus one half mb r square. So we can basically calculate that as the you know, total momentum, which is basically whatever I have in the parentheses. All right, so if we calculate everything together, we should get 2.9 radians per second as the final angular, you know, speed of the system after basically the collision. Okay, after you drop one over the other. Alrighty then. So that's, this is, you know, you can see that this is kind of like an example where you are, you know, using angular, uh, you know, uh, conservation of angular momentum of two, you know, interacting system like that. All right, so we can also have a rolling motion. So we have been talking about, you know, system that is sliding, which is a linear translational motion. Then we talked about system that is rotating, which is just basically just rotating. Then we can also have a system that is rolling, which means both rotating and moving in a linear direction. So that's something we can have. So you can read where the red curve shows the path moved by a point on the rim of an object. So imagine if you have a, like a, let me just use a different color. Maybe I think like you have some kind of disc, right? And this will be like, let's say center of mass of the disc. See if you're rotating the disc, if you have some kind of point, right? On the rim, as the disc is rotating, this point basically goes in a path like that because you know it is rolling, right? But the center of mass just goes in a straight line like that, okay? So the center of mass moves in a straight line 
where that point on the rim because things like this. So a little bit later time, the disc is here. So that point actually moved here, right? So because of that rotation. So that's kind of what you have. And you can kind of combine this motion together. So this is known as a cycloid, right? So the green line shows the path of a center of mass. The red is basically path of a particle on the, on the rim of the, of the, let's say, disc. So the surface must exert friction forces on each other. Otherwise, the object would slide rather than roll. Think like this. If you have a disc on a surface, in order for it to, let's say, if you push on it, uh, if there is no friction, it will just basically move, you know, all parts will move in the same direction and it will be just sliding, okay? But let's say if you push and there is a friction, then what happens is start rolling. That means, you know, this part goes forward, this part goes backward and it starts basically rolling like that, okay? So you need friction for rolling. Otherwise you will be sliding. But, you know, when it's rolling, the static friction actually makes you roll and, you know, it just basically allows you to, to roll. And one of the things we're gonna see here is even if there's a friction to allow you to roll, in a, in a, from an energy point of view, you know, do you actually have a conservation of energy? We will see that in an example. All right, so in pure rolling motion, an object rolls without slipping. In such a case, there's a simple relationship between rotational and translational motion. Okay, now what, remember, rotational is something is just rotating, translational is something is just moving. And then in a way, what you have here is ro rolling is basically, you know, combined motion, which we know, we'll, you know, I will show you in a minute. So think like this. So let's say you have a, let's say you have this disc. Okay. Say thing like this. If it's just purely moving in a translational motion, then you can say that, imagine it is sliding. So then center of mass is moving with the V center of mass. Then the top, moving with the V center of mass. And then the bottom moving with the V center of mass because it's sliding, right? You're just basically pushing and there is, let's say it's sliding, okay? What if this disc is now just rotating? Well, if it's just rotating, remember, center of mass is not moving if it's something just rotating. So think like this is, this is just linear or well, let me do it like this, translational. And this is just rotation. Okay. Well, if it's rotating, then let's say the top moving at the you know V center of mass to the left, bottom is V center of mass in opposite direction, right? Because it's rolling like that. Oh, sorry, rotating like that. Okay. So it's rotating, for example, here clockwise. All right. So then what I have here is this V center of mass is equals to remember is the root of the linear position, ds dt. But remember, S is the arc length, which is, you know, R times, you know, R times theta, right? So then dS dt becomes R times d theta dt, which we've seen that before, right? R times d theta dt. And d theta dt is just omega, which is just basically saying V is equals to R times omega. And we already know that, right? We already know that. And A center of mass is dV center of mass dt, where V center of mass is, you know, you know, basically R times omega because it's, but because it's the derivative of that becomes R d omega dt and the omega dt is then alpha. In a way it's talking about like, let's say R specifically being the, uh, let's say the radius of the, of the system. Now, and think like this, what I have here is this. On the left, I have just purely translational motion. On the right, I have purely rotational motion. Ro rolling then it's combination of those, that means if I'm combining them together, now imagine then this represents rolling. Okay, so then for the for the rolling, imagine now I'm combining the top, v center of mass, v center of mass. So the top becomes two v center of mass because I'm adding those two together. The center of mass itself, the center becomes v center of mass for translational plus zero for rotational. So this is just v center of mass. How about at the bottom? Well, translational V center of mass is to the right, rotational V center of mass is to the left, right? At the bottom, right? The velocity is to the right and to the left and they cancel each other. So you can say V, this is V top, this is V center of mass, and this is then V at the bottom, right? 
equals zero, which means the bottom of the you know, disk or a tire or something like that is actually, you can assume that instantaneously at the rest, okay? Which is actually quite a correct approximation. So we can assume that because let's say that when you have a disk rolling at the bottom, you have a static friction. That's why it's not a kinetic friction. So it's not gonna dissipate energy. It actually can conserve energy, okay? So it can conserve energy. So it's a thing like this, something like that, right? So that's so that the top basically moving at two V center of mass, center is moving with a center of mass velocity and the, at the bottom velocity is zero. It is at rest. So you can see a point on the rim rotates various position. So at any instant, the point on the rim located at point P is at the rest relative to the surface since no slipping occurs. So if no slipping, no slipping, uh, slipping occurs, this point P, which is at the bottom in contact with the surface, you can say that instantaneously, right, is at rest. All right, then if your system is rolling, it could be a sphere, it could be a disc, right? Um, it could be a cylinder, right? Then you are basically dealing with rolling motion, which is in a way your, you know, it's a combination of translational and rotational, right? As, as I mentioned, right? You're basically combining translational and rotational. Then your kinetic energy is one half I center of mass times omega square. This is basically rotational kinetic energy plus one half mass times V center of mass. And this is then translational, again, not T, not tangential, but translational kinetic energies. And those are, you know, you have to understand are, you know, uh, two different type of uh, energies, right? One based on the linear motion of the object, the other one based on its rotation. So if the object is just sliding, then this is zero. So then you have just a, you know, translational motion. If object is just, you know, rotating, not sliding, not rolling, right? Then this is zero. You have just a rotational kinetic energy. But something there is rolling, then we'll have both. So an example of that will be for, you know, let's say uh, you have a disc, right? Or, or, a, or a ball or a sphere or something like that going down on incline, okay? So, and uh, even if there is now, you know, basically a friction and we need friction for it to roll, right? Imagine if there is no friction, it's gonna be sliding. If there is a friction, it will be then rolling. So then we can still use the same conservation of energy, right? Accelerated rolling motion is possible only if friction is present between the sphere and the incline. The friction produces a net torque requires for the rotation, okay? So then what I have here is this, despite the friction, no loss of mechanical energy occurs because the contact point is at rest relative to the surface at any instant. So we have then total kinetic energy in terms of rotational and translational. The only thing we do here is this, remember this equation, right? V center of mass is equals to R times omega. So one of the things we can do, we can take omega and replace it with V center of mass over R. And what we, that's what we have. Remember here, it was omega square. So we re replace omega square with V center of mass over R and become square. That means I have both terms, rotational kinetic energy and translational kinetic energy now written in terms of linear velocity rather, rather than angular velocity. That's something you wanna do because you know, you can then just factor out V center of mass because both, you know, V center of mass are exactly the same for each term. So you can factor out and have a little bit simpler calculation. Okay. So then whenever then you have, let's say object going down incline here, you can still do the same thing. Take this as to be a point A, right? For example, or let's say your initial position. And then this is being your final position. Then we can do the conservation of energy. I can say then energy is combination of kinetic and potential at the top or the sum, right? Equals conservation of, you know, mechanical energy at the bottom, which is final energy plus final kinetic energy plus final gravitational potential energy. If the system starts from rest, there is no kinetic energy at the top. If it goes to your reference position at the bottom, there is no, you know, uh, potential energy at the bottom. Something we have done many times. But instead of saying one half mv squared equals mgh, now we have, you know, kinetic energy that is combination of both rotational and translational. So that means, you know, this is basically my total kinetic energy, which we just basically derived here, right? Uh, 
is a total kinetic energy for a rolling object. So then I can take this and I can replace this K final in terms of the total kinetic energy, but I can still solve for the final speed of the system of the, of the object right at the bottom, but now taking into account that it is, you know, energy in terms of both the rotational and let's say kinetic. And actually, you know, uh, in a way there, there's more, more energy, right? Because object actually, you know, has both rotational and translational. So there's more energy, you know, let's say in the system. So we have one example here that we can kind of, you know, do it in terms of this uh, object going down an incline. So let's say you have a solid uniform spherical boulder rolls down the hill as shown, well, ignore this number uh, uh, in, in figure below. Starting from rest, when it is five, uh, 50 meter above the bottom, um, you know, basically that's when we, we have to start the object and we start from the rest. So starting from rest when it's 50 meter above the bottom. So the upper, upper half of the hill is free of ice. So the boulder rolls without slipping. All right, that means basically, let's take this to be point A. And then let's say here's point B, where this, you know, from A to B, if there's a rough surface, there's a friction, right? Uh, which is, is free of ice. That means it's, there's a rough surface, so, you know, friction, and it is rolling without slipping. But the lower half is covered with perfectly smooth ice. That means going from B to C, then you have basically a frictionless surface, so ice. The question is how fast is the boulder moving when it reaches bottom of the hill, which is point C? Well, we have to break this down into two parts. And that's simply because our system moves with, you know, uh, at two different surfaces, right? From A to B and then from B to A. And you have to understand that going from B to A, uh, our surface is then, sorry, from A to B, the friction is allows the object to roll then from B to C, because it's smooth, there is no friction, it then gonna start sliding down. So we have to kind of break it down completely to two different, uh, two different parts. All right, so then what I will do here is this. I'm gonna say, all right, so I'm gonna first look at from A to B, okay? And I can say that, all right, so I can take this like that and I say, all right, so um, you, can, you can say then, all right, position of A is 50 meters, position of B here is then 25 meters, right? About halfway. So I can say then, all right, so Ka plus Ua is equals to Kb plus Ub. All right, so Ka is zero because it starts from rest, but Ub is not zero because that's, you know, I have kinetic a potential energy there. So then I can say then M times G times Ya equals then Kb, which is then gonna be my kinetic energy but it's a kinetic energy of a rolling system. So it's one half M times uh, VA square plus one half I times omega, you know, sorry, B. So omega B square, then plus MGYB. Right, so I have to do this uh, because I do have both translational and rotational kinetic energies, and there's a potential energy at point B as well. But in any case, so I am given the values of everything. So what, I, what I'm looking for here is this. I wanna know how fast the system is moving when it gets to point B, because I know the position of point A and B. I know the speed at point A, but I don't know the speed of the particle or the, of the, of the object right at point B. And that's what I'm gonna try to find. So. Let's say if, if I rearrange, I have this one half M V B square plus one half. Now I omega B square, remember I want V not omega. So I'm gonna replace this with, I'm gonna say, all right, so this is I, remember this basic I center of mass, then V B becomes V at B, sorry, omega, right? Omega, I'm gonna replace it with V over R like that. So it becomes linear speed, over the radius square, right? Because omega equals B over R. Then this is equals to then MGYB, sorry, YA minus MGYB. That means I switched and I moved the other one to the other side, potential energy. All right, so hopefully you got, you're good with that. So now what I'm gonna do here is this, right? So you can see that 
I have now VB square and VB square over there. Okay, so I'm gonna say, right, so it's one half M. So I can factor out VB square. So VB square equals one half M plus one half I center of mass over R square. And this is equals to, and here I can factor out MG then times YA minus YB. So from here, I can rearrange it a little bit. So I can say this is VB square times. So here what I have is this one half M plus one half. Now, what is sent, you know, moment of inertia of a, of a boulder, which is basically a sphere, solid sphere. Well, moment of inertia is two fifth M R square. And this is divided by R square, right? So this is this moment of inertia of I center of mass, two fifth M R square. And this is equals to the MG times YA minus YB is just 25 meters. But here I can see this, R square and R square cancels out. And then one half times two fifth, this cancels out. So this becomes just one fifth, okay? Then from here, one half plus one fifth gives me basically seven over, you know, uh, 10 over seven, right? Sorry, seven over 10. So I've done seven over 10. So VB square, seven over, over 10 M, because this M and that M are the same, then equals to then MG times 25. I can even cancel the M from both sides and then solve for VB, which will be square root of, 10 over seven times G times 25. G is just 9.8, plug in and calculate to be 18.7 meters per second. That. All right, so try to work it out on your own if you're not able to follow, but it just basically, I did two things, right? I replaced from this very first equation, I replaced omega with V over R, okay? And then moment of inertia of the of the let's say boulder is two fifth m r square because it's a solid disk, solid sphere. Okay. That means velocity at b is eighteen point seven meters per second. Now after that, the system right the boulder going to be sliding from point b to point c. It's going to be sliding because there is no friction to make it roll. That means all I have here is KB plus UB is equals to KA plus UA. Sorry, not A, but C, going from B to C. And since point C is my reference, so there is no potential energy over there because the position of C is equals to zero. That means what I have here is then, thing like this, uh, kinetic energy going from B to C is just kinetic energy basically based on the, you know, uh, the speed that it has right now, uh, you know, 18.7 meter per second. And this is just up from that, it's just gonna be only linear, nothing else. That means going from B to C, it's gonna be sliding rather than rolling. That means it just becomes one half VB square plus MGYB equals then one half MVC square. That's it. Then I can use this, right, to calculate my speed at point C, which is speed at the bottom. That's what half is moving at the bottom. Again, I can cancel the mass and rearrange and solve for VC, which will be then square root of VB square plus two G Y B. Okay, if I rearrange and you multiply both sides by two, this is what I get. All right, so then plug in the values, which is the speed B at 18.7, position of B is 25 meters, right? So if I do if I do it like this, so 18.7 square plus two times 9.8 times 25, what I will get here is 29 meters per second. And that's my final speed when it reaches the bottom, okay? When it reaches bottom of the incline. So that's, that's, what, that's what you can see, right? You have to take into account if there is a friction, if it's gonna be able to roll or if there is no friction and it's gonna be then sliding down. All right guys, so this concludes then part three and chapter 10.